committee met all day Wednesday and into the late evening, deciding on the rules of debate and the number of amendments allowed for the 1995 Budget Reconciliation Bill. The legislation would change existing laws in an attempt to balance the budget by the year 2002. Congressman Gerald Solomon of New York chairs the committee. seats and uh, this uh, today the rules committee meets on the single most important piece of legislation that this Congress will uh, perhaps ever consider it is HR 2491 the seven-year balanced budget reconciliation act uh, reconciliation act of 1995 Say <laughs> this, right. uh, this legislation which actually implements the changes in entitlements and in revenues which are necessary to reach a balanced budget in the year 2002. Appearing before the Rules Committee will be the uh, unbelievably hard-working Chairman of the Budget Committee, John Kasich, who deserves thanks from all of us for the enormous effort he has put into making this process work. Uh, and believe me, that, uh, that is very, very difficult. The Ranking Minority Member, Mr. Martin Sabo, also deserves uh, our commendations as well. The budget resolution passed by the House directed a total of 12 committees to report changes in laws within their jurisdiction to make cuts in spending and cuts in taxes in specified amounts. The chairman and ranking minority members uh, of each of those 12 committees are to be commended for the time and energy they have put into this legislation. Each of the 12 committees were to report their recommendations to the budget committee and under the Budget Act, it is then the duty of the Budget Committee to assemble those recommendations into one package and bring the package to the House floor. If any committee does not submit its required recommendations to the Budget Committee, then the Budget Act provides that the Rules Committee may make an order and amendment to achieve the changes directed in the budget resolution passed by the House. In other words, we are bound by that budget resolution, John. It is also the job of the Rules Committee to come up with a fair and a workable procedure for the consideration of the Budget Reconciliation Bill on the House floor, and this committee intends to do just that. Members, for more than a quarter of a century, past Congresses have been unable to balance the budget, and as a result, our children and our grandchildren are being saddled with a heavy burden of debt which will make life much more difficult for them and for future generations to come. As far as this member is concerned, this is inability to live within our means is the most critical issue that will ever face this Congress. In order to solve the problems, we're going to have to make some very, very difficult choices, each and every one of us uh, affecting our districts back home. It will be tough medicine for all of us, but it is the medicine we must take to cure ourselves of this interminable deficit that has turned us into a, the largest, think about this, the largest debtor nation in the world. And that is exactly what we are today. As we have tried to make these tough choices necessary to protect future generations, there are those who have t attacked us as being mean-spirited. Um, but what is really mean-spirited and what is greedy is to keep spending money we do not have and leaving the bills to these future generations. The American people have said in a poll after poll that they want us to balance this budget. This is our chance to do it right here in this committee here today. We are ready to begin the hearing, but before we do, I will be happy to yield to the very distinguished ranking minority member of the committee, Mr. Joe Moakley from Boston, Massachusetts, if he has any uh, opening statements. Joe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And when you said that we have become the largest debt in nation, my eyes immediately were transfixed on former President Reagan up there, oh. who happened to be the author of the largest deficit that this nation ever went through. You know that presidents can't spend money, only Congress can do it. Oh, well, he made a good attempt at it. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I was just looking at the calendar, and I noticed that the Rules Committee is considering Mr. Gingrich's reconciliation bill of horrors. I guess the Republicans are just moving Halloween up a week. This bill lays out the specific program cuts that are being used to pay for the speaker's tax cuts for the very, very rich. It's hard to decide which is worse, 
Is it worse to cut $270 billion from Medicare, on which 923,000 Massachusetts seniors rely? Or is it worse to take away health coverage for 200,000 Massachusetts children? Or is it worse, Mr. Chairman, to raise the taxes on the working families with two or more children by $440? Or is it worse to eliminate home energy assistance for 130,000 Massachusetts families? I just can't decide, and we shouldn't have to. This Congress has absolutely no business in giving big tax breaks to the very rich and cutting programs for everyone else in order to pay for it. I believe this Congress should be in the business of promoting jobs for America and not taking them away. I believe this Congress should do, be making sure that every American child gets the best possible education and gets enough to eat every day. And I believe that this Congress should ensure that American senior citizens get the health care that they've earned and they deserve. Mr. Chairman, I believe that this Congress should help working families stay warm in the winter. And I do not, under any circumstances whatsoever, think we should be slashing health, education, housing, and nutrition programs for the working families. In order to pass out more tax cuts goodies to people who really don't need them and who really aren't clamoring for them. This reconciliation bill is a Republican version of Halloween. Working families get tricked and the rich get treated. And what does this mean in dollars? For those of you who are making less than $50,000, you'll get tricked out of some $648 in benefits. And for those of you making more than $350,000 a year, congratulations, you'll get treated to a tax cut of $14,000. So I'd like to urge my Republican colleagues to give up this Medicare for tax breaks deal with disaster. If you give up the tax breaks for the rich, you'll be able to afford a lot of very good programs for the best of America. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this <coughs> statement. Well, thank you very much, Joe. And uh, now we'll hear from the, uh, the hardworking chairman of the, uh, the Budget Committee. Uh, John, we appreciate all the work that you've done uh, trying to uh, to pull all of this together from the other 12 committees has been a, just a Herculean task, and uh, we admire and respect you for it. You have the floor. Your entire Mr. Chairman, will may I, the record. I'd like to. Uh, John Kasich is probably one of the hardest members, hardest working members up here. We disagree, not only in this on baseball and basketball and football, but also on the budget. But having said that, I take nothing away from John Kasich. He is an outstanding member of the Congress. Well, uh, l let me you know. let me just say it's the first time uh, I've been able to appear before the Rules Committee since Mr. Mobley's come back. And uh, I was up in uh, Plymouth, Mass. here two weeks ago, and uh, they just all wanted to know how you were doing, frankly, and I told them that you were doing great. I told them that it was just, uh, <laughs> I told them you were doing well, but I, I told them you weren't doing quite as well after the the Indians shellacked the Red Sox. Now we're going in a new. We're getting rid of the Boston Garden. We're moving into a new arena, sir. I know. Do we do we have any tickets? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it settled now before I hear any. If you maybe we can make a couple provisions for you in this bill. <laughs> and you know you got this tunnel. Wait a minute. I got you now. You got this tunnel. You want this funding? Just remember that, guys. <laughs> It was funded before we got the tunnel. It's the Ted Williams tunnel. It's funneled. It's funneled. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, John Casey is such a good friend of mine that he wanted to see this basketball game so badly. We put two more chairs on the floor. There you go. Thank you. He gave his own box seat. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, appreciate being here. And rather than going through uh, the, this whole thing, and I, I don't want to make any, uh, use a whole lot of uh, rhetoric here this morning, other than to tell you that uh, this is like the, uh, the second installment that I had argued would come, and uh, it's, I have the privilege and the, uh, the opportunity to come here and represent the Republican team this morning, and that's what this is, is a team effort. When we did the, um, the budget resolution, I came up here and, and said what the outline was, and people said it would be easy to pass the budget, but just wait until reconciliation. Then I came back when we were about to pass the contract, paying for the contract, which, by the way, we paid for uh, without any uh, uh, cuts or savings from Medicare. Um, 
And they said that there's no way you could balance the budget, strengthen defense, provide tax relief for Americans, be able to get this job done. And while you may be paying for the contract and paying for your tax cuts by cutting foreign aid and a lot of discretionary duplication there, um, <clears throat> they said when it gets to reconciliation, you won't be able to get that done. And so now we're up here today, I'm up here today, uh, with this proposal to uh, lay down the changes in the entitlement programs that will take us to a balanced budget. And uh, I think if there's anything that um, those who are opposed to our ideas uh, have to concede, that is that uh, we really have kept our word, which is very unusual, I think, for uh, people in this town that they, their campaign promises, not that they're bad, but their campaign promises usually exceed their delivery, and today our delivery is equaling our campaign promises and our deeds are matching our rhetoric. Now the amazing thing, the statistic that I think people are not aware of in this country, as much as they ought to be, let me just start with, uh, with John Kennedy. John Kennedy created the first $100 billion budget. From 1776 to 1962, we lived with less than a $100 billion budget. <clears throat> Our budget now is a trillion and a half dollars per year. So from 1962 to 1995, we went from $100 billion to a trillion and a half. Now, those numbers are not understandable, so let me try to make them more understandable. <clears throat> if Joe uh, Moakley had opened up a great pizza place in the north end of Boston when Christ was on earth, if he lost a million dollars a day seven days a week, he would have to lose a million dollars a day seven days a week for the next 700 years to get to one trillion. Our budget is a trillion and a half, the national debt is five trillion dollars. And Sonny Montgomery, the great Democrat from Mississippi, came up to me with a newspaper article and showed me that, that by, on November the 15th, the federal government is going to have to lay down a debt service payment somewhere, a debt service. I don't want to talk in debt service, that's Wall Street talk. We've got to pay the interest on our debt and it's going to cost us 25 billion dollars on the 15th of November. 25 billion bucks that just goes to pay the interest on the national debt. Now, over the last seven years, the government of the United States has spent cumulatively nine and a half trillion dollars on total federal spending. 9.5 trillion. In order to balance the budget, strengthen defense, provide tax relief to Americans over the next seven years, federal spending is not going to go down. It's going to go up by nearly three trillion dollars. We are going to go from 9.5 trillion dollars in spending over the last seven years to 12.2 trillion dollars in total federal spending over the next seven years. And that's what, makes, that's what makes the proposal so reasonable. Whether it's Medicare, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's welfare, each one of these entitlement programs are going to continue to go up. They're just not going to go up at the rate that they have been going up. Our approach is really fairly simple. And I know that there is some deep concern on, on the part of people like Joe Moakley, deep and legitimate concern. And in some of the areas, I share them. But you know, for the last 30 years, really since about the time of Kennedy and Johnson, some argue back to Roosevelt, I would argue more along the lines of Kennedy and Johnson, we sent a whole lot of power and money and influence to this city, thinking that if we're addressing these problems where we live, if we just send it to Washington where they are a little bit smarter, where they're a little bit more powerful, they'll be able to fix all the problems down there. And frankly, for the last 30 years, we've made some great progress. We created a Medicare program. It was a, it's been a wonderful thing for our senior citizens. Uh, we have solved many problems having to do with education in this country, civil rights. But now, I think the American people have gotten the sense that frankly, in Washington, they don't do it better than what we can do it where we live. 
And what this approach is about is about a pendulum effect. That's what makes it so reasonable. The pendulum has swung so far up here where we have, we have across America almost felt disenfranchised, powerless, powerless in this country. And what this is about is bringing the pendulum back so that we take power, money, and influence out of this city and put it back in the hands of the American people and the communities and the states across this country. I think it's a very reasonable program. If we were going from nine and a half trillion to seven and a half trillion, I guess there would be a reason to be real worked up. But to spend $3 trillion more over the next seven years and have, have to live with that uh, increased amount of spending and allocate it reasonably makes perfect sense. And the ability to do this will, will do one thing. It'll stop adding to the crushing national debt, and it will end the fear that American mothers and fathers have that their children are just simply not going to be as well off as, as they were when they as compared to their parents. I mean, that's the great American legacy. Your kids are going to be better than you. And if we keep going where we're going, we're going to enter a no-growth phase in this country. And what's that mean? The rich will get richer, the poor will get poorer, and our society will begin to break down. This proposal is very reasonable. It's a very common sense approach. And frankly, what it's going to do, if we're able to do it, and I believe we will, at the end of the day, once the president signs on to balancing the budget in seven years, and trying to create some real changes in the way we run our government, I believe we'll save the country for 100 years. And uh, that's frankly what it's all about. And uh, so I'm, I'm proud to be here, uh, Mr. Chairman. There are some concerns that people on the Democratic side will have with our proposal, some of which will be well-founded. When you're moving this much and making this level of change, you don't get everything right. But frankly, uh, we'll be big enough to say where we didn't do it right. But I think overall, we've done a, a great job. I think we're, we've kept our word, and we have put the country first and politics second. I'm proud to be here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, John, we're, uh, we're certainly proud to, to have you here. Um, you know, you read so much in the papers uh, about uh, what, is, uh, what is happening. And, as I looked down through the, uh, through the budget last night, and I looked at programs like WIC and Head Start and school lunch programs and Medicare and the RSVP programs for seniors, and I didn't find any cuts. In other words, all of those, in other words, uh, have been increased. Where, where I found the cuts was in the restructuring of government. And what we have done, what you have done and the other committees, is to literally shrink the size and the power of the federal government. And that is what the American people want. You know, we started that, uh, David Dreyer and, uh, and the rest of us, um, on op opening day, when we actually reduced the number of committees, we reduced the number of subcommittees, we reduced the number of payroll employees on the Congress itself by one third just to set the example of what we wanted to do here today. So it isn't a question of cutting programs for the truly needy. It is a question of sinking the, shrinking the size and the power of the government. And I just think that uh, we certainly are on the right track. That is the only way that you're ever going to get a hold of these huge deficits. For example, as you know, when President Clinton presented his budget to us, his five-year projection, if we had gone along with the status quo, as had been the, the uh, practice in years past, we would have added $1 trillion to that $5 trillion debt. The $250 billion in interest each year would have gone up to almost $350 billion. And God forbid, ladies and gentlemen, if inflation had set back in to what it was under Jimmy Carter at 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 percent, that figure would have almost doubled. And then where would be the money for the truly needy? I just say to you, my friend, God bless you for the work you've done. Let's get this done. And I would yield to my good friend, Mr. James Quiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, John, I tell you, I think the American people should listen to you. I think there's a misconception on the other side of the aisle that this is a bad proposal. I don't feel that it is. Something has to be done. We know it. And in crystal clear language, you've outlined what needs to be done. I don't agree with all the provisions. I don't think anyone agrees with all the provisions. But on the other hand, put together, it'll get the job done. And I appreciate the good work you do and your committee and for being here this morning to let us 
secure you, and I'm glad that you load the wagon and just presented your views and what we're going to be faced with in the future. I think the last time uh, I wore Elvis today, it's the last time we had an Elvis sighting, we had a balanced budget, and the last time we had a balanced budget, I think you were in the House of Representatives. Could you imagine, Mr. Quillen, that if we took up this reconciliation bill and we defeated it on the House floor, we would have to go home and tell people we failed. We didn't get the job done. What, 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 what would happen then? What would we do then? I mean, the President's budget proposal is running $200 billion in debt. I mean, we just have to address this. And we have to address it, frankly, in a bipartisan way. And, and over time, this is going to receive more bipartisan support, sir. But we have to get it done. We don't, we don't have any choice here. Well, I agree with you, John. It's important that we get the job done. You presented it in crystal clear language. You know, it was interesting indeed to hear the president say out in Houston to a bunch of fat cats he made a mistake by increasing taxes too much. Oh, you hear that, Jim, huh? I'd like to repeat it again. <laughs> well, then get close to the microphone. <laughs> and I think the tax cut is long overdue. Well, the and tax cut... he re realized he made a mistake, and I hope he signs this bill. The, the interesting thing is that he said in Houston that, and I... He said he wouldn't have raised taxes that much. You want to know something? I probably believe him. He probably wouldn't have. Had he had it, you know, and, but he had a key, he couldn't get any votes from us because we didn't want to raise taxes at all. And you might remember we had a proposal that didn't raise taxes that the budget committee wrote. Um, same deficit reduction, no tax increase. But then he had a chance at Penny Kasich and he rejected that one, which was a mistake. But let's just take him at his word that he didn't want to raise taxes as much. And I don't want to not, want, I don't want to bash the president. But this proposal just basically cancels out part of the tax increase that we had in 1993. So when people run around and say there shouldn't be any tax relief for Americans, let's talk about that for a second. I mean, I don't think the Democrats, maybe they all are, but I tell you this, I'm going, I'm going to tell you this right now, the White House is going to be for a capital gains reduction. You know why? Because everybody knows you've got to reduce the tax on capital and, ta and reduce the, risk, the tax on risk taking. I mean, everybody knows that. There, I mean, there may be five people out here in America who don't agree with it, but I will tell you, we will have a capital gains tax cut in the final agreement. And so I, I would say to my colleagues on the Democratic side, be careful because intellectuals and people on Main Street in America know you've got to reduce the cost of risk taking, that's how you create jobs. Remember I said the only people that hate rich people are guilty rich people. Uh, and you know, it's not all rich people. You get a, mother, a, a husband and a wife, they're farmers, they, they got a farm out there, they want to sell their land when they get to be 72 years old, and all of a sudden we call them rich. I mean, the, the bottom line is, is that we got to have lower capital gains uh, tax. Everybody knows that. Okay, and any the other provision that's for the rich is a family tax relief plan. Now, we eliminate the Commerce Department, we save about six billion dollars, and we think some of the money that, that goes to that bureaucracy over there ought to go back in the pockets of people who've been paying the bills. How can you be against that? I mean, this, when you talk about, uh, uh, about the tax cuts for the rich, I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, it's a mantra, and I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's working very well, sir. And, so our, all our plan goes is to reduce some of the increased tax burden that was placed on Americans in 93. Americans don't want to be taxed more, they want to be taxed less. I think you're exactly right, and I, I, and I was glad to hear the President say that because I feel he's leaning to sign this measure. I hope he will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. John Joseph Moakley. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, just a couple of minutes ago, Mr. Chairman, you alluded to uh, that nobody is going to get hurt as a result of this program. I have figures from the Council of Economic Advisors, and I'm sure you're familiar with that group, that said 2,622 children in Massachusetts 
and 180,000 children nationwide uh, will be denied a head start in the year 2002, compared with the year 1995. Also denied will be 16,200 Massachusetts children basic and advanced skills in 1996. The Republican budget cuts Title I by $1.1 billion, a 17% cut in 1996, denying Title I funding for 1.1 million disadvantaged students nationwide and 16,200 children in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Title I funds in Massachusetts will be cut by $20.4 million in 1996. Cut safe and drug-free schools, which 325 out of 357 school districts in Massachusetts use to keep crime, violence, and drugs away from 530,289 children, their schools, and their communities. Eliminates goals 2000, denying improved teaching and learning for as many as 98,900 school children in Massachusetts in 1996, and by the year 2002, 222,400 children in Massachusetts would be denied improved education compared now with the President's balanced budget. It also eliminates AmeriCorps' National Service Program, denying 1,744 young people in Massachusetts the opportunity to serve their communities in 1996, eliminates summer jobs for 12,110 youths in Massachusetts in 1996, and 87,770 youths over seven years. The Republican budget eliminates summer youth employment program, which provides job experience and skills to 600,000 youths each summer. I can go on and on and on, John, but I think you get where I'm coming from and, and the figures that I'm putting out there that disagree okay. with the tenor that I'm hearing here sure. this morning. Let me, let me just say to you that, first of all, on the summer youth job training program, I agree with you. I don't think we should have gotten rid of it. I think it was a bad decision on our part. I hope we can restore it and create some other priorities next year. I agree with that. I just think we shouldn't have done that. Okay, we, but that's, uh, you, you don't get everything right. But we'll be big enough to say maybe next year we'll, we'll get together and we'll, we'll make sure that program gets saved. Um, but let me talk about some of the others. Go goals 2000. Joe, we have a fundamental disagreement as to whether we should run primary and secondary education out of Washington or whether we ought to run it right at the local school district. I believe we ought to run it locally. I, don't, I think that bigger is not better when it comes to schools. And uh, Goals 2000 uh, is not a program that is going to d disrupt the kids in Westerville, Ohio. Frankly, what I would like to see, particularly for our large urban districts, is to have large urban districts made smaller. And I believe firmly that the only way we're going to solve the problems in our schools is by having local control and more parental involvement and more discipline. And I don't think Goals 2000 does that. I don't think Goals, two, Goals 2000 is, a, is built on the old model that we can dictate from Washington. I don't agree with it. Head Start. Head Start funding is going to continue to go up each year. Now, it may not go up to the degree that some in this city want, but it is going to continue to go up. And as you know, increasing amounts of Head Start is not going into programs for children, it's going into staff, which, I mean, is, you know, I mean, you have a legitimate internal debate on Head Start. Um, but what I will tell you is we are not cutting Head Start funding. It's not going to grow as fast as, uh, as it would uh, uh, with some people's plans here in town, but they're not cuts. AmeriCorps. You know, in America, I hear people say, you know, I'm a volunteer. How much am I going to get paid? It's like an oxymoron. I, I thought a volunteer didn't get paid. You know how many AmeriCorps people are working in federal departments in this government? This is, another, this is a program where they're working down at the Department of Agriculture. AmeriCorps was originally designed to put people to work in local communities, and a big chunk of the people are working down there in, in the federal bureaucracy. But beyond that, AmeriCorps didn't exist a couple years ago. Now we act as though if, if we don't have it, you know, civilization's going to cease to exist as we know it. We'll do fine if we don't have an AmeriCorps program. Safe and drug-free schools. We have an, a number of programs that are designed to provide safe and drug-free schools. 
part of our program is to consolidate. We got about 80 programs, wait, 80 programs, 160 separate job training programs. Maybe you could argue it's 110. But we don't think you ought to have all these duplicative programs. Trade. We have 71 entities of government doing trade right now. So if we, we get rid of trade in the Commerce Department, doesn't mean we're against trade. We're against consolidating and saving money. And we're all for safe and drug-free schools, but in one category, not a bunch of different categories. The Council of Economic Advisors, they work for the President. And they say they have a balanced budget. And the President has no balanced budget. His budget is 200, you know that, let me stop there. I didn't get into any more of that rhetoric. I think that <clears throat> some of your concerns are legitimate. I've already told you on summer jobs, but the rest of them, frankly, I think we're handling them well. But what I will tell you, Joe, is if we cannot deal with making priorities, um, we're all going down the tubes. You know it. Yeah. Now, maybe we can argue priorities, and at the end of the day, if the president wants to argue some of these priorities, I think that's legitimate, but we cannot get away from the discipline of getting a, a budget balance. Because, let me tell you, every kid in the country who you want to help and I want to help are the kids that they don't have much. All they want is a little opportunity. And I, I believe that if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to end up in a society where the kids that you and I relate the best to are the ones that have the least amount of opportunity. I agree, John, that we have to put priorities out there, establish certain criteria. But I don't believe that a $750 billion tax break belongs in that list when you're establishing priorities. Because the first priority goes to Mr. Well-Off. And that's not the nature of our action. Okay. It shouldn't be the nature of our let, action. Let, let, Joe, you're not against reducing capital gains tax, I'm, No, right? I'm not. Okay, well, that's, that's okay then. If I took the family tax credit, which goes up to 200000 and I lower it down to 100000 would the, you then say that we have a balanced tax package? I, because the only other thing you can scream about in terms of taxing the rich is the capital gains business. It, well, evidently it would be more in balance. I don't know if it would be a balanced budget. Well, but all, you'd have, all you would have left is you'd have a capital lower the, the, the tax on risk-taking. Which you got to be far. I mean, you got to you got to be off the charts to oppose that. And I'm going to tell you, the administration's for a lower capital gains tax. Now they want to target it more, but they're for lowering the risk-taking costs in the country. We have an internal debate here as to whether our tax cut ought to go to 200,000. I think Jerry, you're, or the chairman here, is for lowering that threshold, uh, getting it down. We're going to have a legitimate debate in conference. Um, uh, but, but I've got to tell you that in terms of this overall package, I mean, outside of capital gains, I don't know how you argue that there's provisions in here for the rich. Yeah. Would the gentleman yeah. yield? Uh, yes. Good point. You know, I'd just like to in inject this. Uh, you know, whether there is a tax cut or not, it has nothing to do with the issue. The issue is what has happened to the federal budget over all these years. And it has just increased, it has skyrocketed in cost. And John, I heard you say something early on in your testimony, I thought, that we're going to be spending something like three trillion more yeah. over the next seven years than we did in the last seven years. Right. And that means, just for example, Massachusetts is going to get a lot more money than they've got in the last seven years. They're going to get a lot more yeah. in the next seven years. So it isn't a question of whether there's tax cuts in there. That's, a, that's another let, subject. Let me entirely. say it. Yeah, yes. you, you know, I almost, uh, you, thank you. I want to thank the chairman because when you're talking about the $500 oh, tax oh, oh, credit, and you're talking about a family in um, South Boston, Newton, Mass. Okay. okay. The family in Newton, Mass, we take the Commerce Department. Joe, the Commerce Department is an attic for political junkies. I mean, if, you don't, if your kid works in political campaign, doesn't get a job, go to the Commerce Department. We are, we're going to zero out the Commerce Department by killing two, essentially, two big programs. One is the Advanced Technology Program, which is corporate welfare, which I'm thrilled to get rid of because I like to sock it to the big corporations that have lobbyists here that are using subsidies from taxpayers to fund their operations. And uh, the... Um, and, and eliminating, for example, the NTIA in the commerce. We get rid of a bunch of bureaucracy. We consolidate trade. We save $6 billion over, uh, I think it's over five years, okay? 
over seven years. It's somewhere between six and eight. The uh, last scoring, I don't recall. The question is, when we get that six billion dollars, should we give any of that back to people who pay the bills? And I think we should. Sure. And, and then when the mother and the father have the $500 tax credit, so instead of paying $1,000 in federal income tax, they got one kid, they pay $500, they save 500 bucks, their kid's better off, in my opinion, for the mother and father to have the money than to have the government have the money. Um, look, the tax relief program is designed to offset the big tax increase program you had in 93. It's about the size and the scope of the federal government, but I respect your concerns on this. John, there are many things that we can disagree upon. Uh, one thing we won't disagree on, that you're uh, well educated, you know your job, and you defend your position well. But one thing that really bothers me is the impact of the public health and environmental cuts on children in Massachusetts. We spent a lot of money cleaning up Boston Harbor. In fact, for the first time, they found phytoplankton on the bottom. Fish actually swim there. People swim there. Lobsters. Raw surge, raw untreated surge will pour into local waters that, that our children swim and play in from outdated treatment systems within Massachusetts. Now, I think to cut that back uh, was, was a shame because once the pollution, the depollution activity ceases, it just reverts to where it was in the beginning. And therefore, this is very important that we've made such strides We've come so much forward that I would hate to see anything that would even suggest that would the gentleman back yield, Would the gentleman yield? I'd love to. I would like you to have you explain to my daughter and son-in-law who are trying to raise children, save for college, and buy a house, why they should pay for Boston Harbor. Well, it's, it's Boston Harbor today, but it could be some other harbor tomorrow. Why doesn't Boston take care of it? Well, because, the te because the, it's a federal mandate that... 43 cities and towns have to come up with $4 billion to, to clean up Boston Harbor that was there long before any of these people even lived there. So it's a federal mandate, an unfed, unfunded federal mandate, and I think the federal government has, an op has a liability, a responsibility to clean it up. Why don't you build, why don't you build your own federal. interstates in Georgia? Uh, now you have a let, let, me, let, me just, let, me, let me just say this. That, I mean, I think part of our program is... Uh, Mr. Moakley, to not have unfunded federal mandates, and frankly, it was a bipartisan effort. The president signed a bill. Number two, right. yeah. we are having concerns in our own party about what we're doing on environmental issues. Okay. Um, and let me just suggest to you that what Mr. Linder says, and I met with the legislature, the member of the legislators, were, uh, legislature from Boston, from Massachusetts, they, they came were, to see me. They were very much impressed with your knowledge of the Red Sox. Well, I, and let, let, me, let, me, let me say to you that on the issue of this, we, we're going to have to face the fact that infrastructure in our wastewater treatment sewage plants all over the country is collapsing, the infrastructure. Um, number one is we need common sense environmental laws that doesn't, don't force us to do silly things and waste money where we need to be doing smarter things. Secondly, every community is facing a basic disintegration of their treatment plants. We can't rescue this from this city. This is something that's, I mean, this is going to have to be something we have to address. And in fact, the federal government's been pretty generous to Boston Harbor. You may not be getting all the money you want, but we have given you some money, we, and there still is money in the bill we, to do this. We but were the, getting all the money we want until this year, John. <laughs> until you and, and, things back. Have, and things have changed. Yeah. But, Look, may, I, may I move on? Now? Yes, I friend. thank the chairman for allowing me the latitude, and I, I, I thank for the indulgence of my colleagues on the committee. But these are matters that I had sure, to get out, and I think this is the place to get them out. Thank you very much, we're, we're letting my friend make up for lost time. He's doing very well at it. <laughs> the, uh, before I yield to Mr. Dreyer, let me point out that um, according to the budget resolution, uh, we are recognizing members that want to testify by committees. I see members coming in and out. We're uh, listening to the uh, rules to the uh, budget committee now. Uh, next will be the committee on agriculture, and we will go by alphabetical order. That is according to the budget resolution and the previous precedent set by the uh, 103rd Congress. So, for members, I just want you to understand that. Mr. David Dreyer, California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Good job per usual, John. Let me uh, at the outset say, after we've gone through this outline of all of these cuts, as Joe calls them, uh, we are ending up with a 24 percent increase in federal expenditures over the next seven years. I think that that needs to be recognized. The other myth that we have been uh, hearing and that many people believe is uh, rather pervasive throughout Washington is that you can't balance the budget at the same time that you want to reduce the tax burden on working Americans. And something that has not been said here is that while we focused on the $500 per child tax credit and the fact that 75% of that will be going to people who are earning less than $60,000 a year, the thing that really burns me is that people don't understand that reducing that tax on capital to which you referred earlier is going to be an important key to our deficit reduction package. Why? Because based on virtually every project projection and empirical evidence in the past, we are going to see the kind of economic growth which my state of California needs badly. You know, when you and I first came here, there was a sense that California was the end of the rainbow for so many people and could never face any challenges, but we have suffered greatly over the past several years in Southern California. And this capital gains tax rate reduction is going to go a long way towards stimulating economic growth, and it will generate an increase in the flow of revenues to the federal treasury. Back in 1993, a group of us got together and formed a, a bipartisan, bicameral, zero capital gains tax caucus. It was bipartisan, bicameral. I had uh, the, the Republican in the Senate who joined me was Connie Mack, and it was bipartisan that the, the Democrats zero capital gains. But we, we put this group together and did a study with a wide range of economists, and we found that going to a 15 percent rate on capital gains, we could, over a seven-year period, increase the gross domestic product by $1.3 trillion, create a million new jobs, and the issue to which everyone's referring on this reconciliation package, we could increase the flow of revenues to the federal treasury by 220 billion dollars. And so it seems to me that when people make this argument that our tax, uh, reducing this tax burden on working Americans, especially in the area of capital gains, is somehow going to hurt us in our quest towards balancing the budget, they are way off base. And I think it's something that needs to be recognized here. Uh, you know, one of the things that people were concerned about is that we would put this plan together using dynamic scoring, and that we would, you know, kind of predict human behavior. Well, we have not done that. But what I will say, David, as you just pointed out, is that if we lower the, the, the tax on capital, it will be a, gen, a revenue generator. We can score it as a big loss of revenue in this plan. Frankly, we're going to end up having lower deficits than what are currently projected because uh, capital gains will, in fact, create jobs. And, and our plan is not just, you know, it's like with a business going bankrupt. You don't just cut overhead, you've got to increase sales. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're reducing the overhead of government while at the same time we're trying to make the economy grow faster. The National Association of Manufacturers, two weeks ago, I was locked out of my office waiting on somebody to open a door, and I read this letter they had, and they said that the old thinking that the economy should only be able to grow at 2.5% should be killed that we should, in fact, grow the economy at 3%, which means more jobs, more revenue for the federal government, easier. Another deal, and that is when we balance the budget, we'll have lower interest rates. So when you couple lower interest rates with capital gains, Greenspan said it, you're going to have a, you're going to have a prosperity in the country you can't chart. And that's what we're searching for. Thank you. We're going to get it. You bet. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd say you, to you, Mr. Mr. Other Chairman, our friend Mr. Kasich, that Mr. Uh, Oakley was quite right in, in speaking about you. You are a good man and a reasonable man, and, and uh, I think it's fair to say that those of us on this side of the aisle are 
as well as your colleagues on that side of the aisle, your side of the aisle, are very happy that you're the person who happens to be in the position as, that you are as chairman of the Budget Committee. Uh, one of the nice things about you, one of the most appealing things about you is your sort of your nice optimistic viewpoint on things. It also, I think it's fair to say you get carried away a little bit every now and then by being that kind of person, which is a nice kind of person to be, may I say. Uh, I think it's fair to say that you... Having said that, well, you, know, you know what I mean. No, no, I, no I, didn't, I did not mean it unkindly. I really didn't. No, I, I the, truth, the fact of the matter is that you mischaracterize Goals 2000. It doesn't increase federal control over local school districts or what's taught there or anything of that sort. And in my opinion, sir, you've mischaracterized AmeriCorps. I know a good many youngsters who are involved in it. And yes, there may well be some in the federal bureaucracy who's not aware of that. Everyone I know who's been in it thinks it's the world's greatest program and are out there working amongst poor folks and, and underprivileged people and, and helping mainly in schools around the country where they need a lot of help and, and where it's, it's serving in some respects as the old WPA or CCC did and, and I think is uh, doing a lot of good for the society as well as creating better citizens and, in terms of those youngsters who are involved in the program, but, but be that as it may. You also may have been a little wrong uh, about, what's a, about how great it is to devolve everything to the states. Uh, there was, after all, a reason originally 20, 30, 40 years ago why so much of this power and spending that you, that you quite correctly mentioned came to the federal government. It's because the other levels of the government were not succeeding in doing the kinds of things that people of this country wanted. We wouldn't have had Medicaid. We wouldn't have had the kind of health care available if the federal government hadn't undertaken it. doesn't mean it has to stay here forever. Uh, but there was a reason for its coming here. And I would remind you, not so much you, you know this, but other people as well, that there are politicians and, and there are bureaucrats at state and local levels as well. You know, and if stuff is going to be run back there, folks are going to understand very quickly they may have made, not that we shouldn't cut spending, not that we shouldn't get people more involved in decision making and so on, but you don't always do a better level at the local level, a better job at the local level. I was telling our colleagues here in this committee the other day, only half facetiously, I didn't, and I, I meant it really, having been a member of the state legislature for a good many years and a member of this Congress for a good many years, uh, I trust the men and women of this Congress to do a good and responsive job, the kind of thing that the folks back home would like us to do more than I would the, the folks in the state legislature back home. I mean, we, we've got good folks here. And uh, just because we're in Washington rather than in Sacramento or some other state capital doesn't mean that we can't do as good a job. And I think in general we do a better job, as a matter of fact, than people do at the state level. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't um, try to do as you are, trying to do away with some of the bureaucracy at whatever level, but simply giving programs to another level of government. And in some cases, as some of us believe, giving an inadequate amount of money to adequately take care of those needs doesn't necessarily solve those problems either. And I'm just afraid that the pendulum you speak of is going to swing back too quickly if we don't do this job awfully carefully because people are going to be clamoring sooner than we would like them to for us to start taking over some of these things again because I'm afraid the states are not in fact going to do an adequate job of taking care of some of these needs. I have just one question if I may, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, many of us in fact do applaud the fact, as I think you, you know, John, that, uh, that you've, you all have set a goal of seven years for bringing the federal budget into balance, but we think that you're trying to, to reach that goal uh, in the wrong way, or at least not in the, in, in the best way. And to a certain extent, you're misleading the American people by justifying all of the cuts that you propose here as being necessary to, uh, to achieve a balanced budget. The fact is, it's not necessary to make all of these cuts in order to balance the budget in seven years, and that will be ad adequately and amply demonstrated by the uh, proposal that will be given us, offered to us uh, by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Stenholm, in just a, a very short time. My only question to you, to you is, Mr. Chairman, is this. Considering the willingness of, of the of the, uh, of the members on, on your side to, to make deep spending cuts in virtually every federal program except for defense and for, and for Social Security. Uh, we could, in fact, get to a balanced budget in less than seven years, couldn't we, if we didn't have tax cuts? And wouldn't that be better in many respects, get us there in four or five years, might it not, give us the benefits of better economic growth, lower interest rates, more savings, and so on in a shorter period of time? And then, if at that time, we in fact did balance the budget, as I'm hopeful that we, that we will, that then we should consider the, the tax cuts that, that you're talking about let, now. Let me... Um, many of us would have far fewer yeah, problems with this, okay. and many of the American people, if it weren't for these, what we believe to be yeah. foolish, and at this point at least uncalled for tax let cuts. Me answer, let me answer that, and then I would like to... Uh, let, me, let me do it this way. I'm not going to tell you that there aren't good things being done by AmeriCorps. Let me start with that, okay? But what I will tell you is where I come from, if you're a volunteer, you don't get paid. 
And the question is, do we need to have a new federal program, which AmeriCorps was? You know, at the time when we're in trouble financially, do we need to create new programs? I support the Peace Corps. I think it, it's made sense. But AmeriCorps has gotten to be a distortion of how it was originally proposed, and secondly, it shouldn't be a priority. I, could com I completely agree disagree with you on Goals 2000, and you talk to local school board people, and they will tell you, we don't need a direction out of Washington. And that's what Goals 2000 is all about. In terms of power and influence going back to the local community, Medicaid, the Medicaid rules dictated by Washington are this thick. If you're 19 years old, you're defined as a child under Medicaid rules. Um, I think that what we're talking about is not, I don't know where Medicaid's going to head in the out years, but what we're talking about now is giving this program to the governors and let them treat their population as they see fit without all the rules and the regulations that clunk up the system. Mr. Chairman, I used to be chairman of the state senate uh, health and welfare committee and the, and the county the county, not the state, yeah. the state were even bigger. The county welfare regulations in Los Angeles County were this high. You've got the same problems at those levels as you do but, at these. But, well, then that's a case to, for every part of government to begin to reinvent Fine. itself. Government has, be, you know, government's become almost anecdotal. You know, what, you know what it is now? Here's the anecdote. The IRS came in to see me today. We had a very pleasant conversation, and in two hours, everything got settled. That's anecdotal. The rule is, they came in to see me, they spend four hours, I don't know, i got to hire a lawyer, a CPA, my business is in trouble, and I don't know when this is ever going to get resolved. I mean, governments become, to some degree, against common sense. And that's part of what we're trying to do by getting it out of here. The other thing is job training. You would agree with me we don't need to have 110 separate job training programs run out of this city. Of it makes more sense to let the county of Los Angeles figure out how to train people, not the people down here. Now, to respond to your, the business about could we do it sooner, um, I don't think we need to do it sooner than seven years. I think that we will, we will get, I mean, I, I would, if I were writing the thing, I could probably squeeze this down to six years, but frankly, we want to make this a reasonable proposal. If we can convince people across the world that we, in fact, have a solid plan to balance the budget, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, that drives, he's the guy that drives the engine in this country, will tell you, you're going to reap all the benefits. Now, where, what about tax cuts? Let's just talk about tax cuts for a second. That's about the size and the scope of the government. We want the government's size to be smaller, and we want individuals to have more money themselves. I mean, that's a legitimate difference between the parties. We believe in lower taxes. And you believe in having the status quo taxes, which is higher taxes, generated by 93. So, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable debate. And look, I say the gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer pointed it out, and I pointed out earlier, can't we make it with a $3 trillion increase in spending? I mean, how much do we need to have a that, $4 that's not, trillion? No, I understand. I mean, that, that's not my question. And, and I suppose you've answered it to the extent you're going to answer it. My question was, if we didn't have to take care of these tax cuts, could we not balance the budget in I, a year or two me, sooner? Would that suggest, not perhaps be a good thing to do? Let me suggest to you that I think that dropping out the capital gains reduction makes it harder for us to balance the budget. You need growth. You need economic growth. And I think it's a, it's a very important part of our program. And we will, we will later have some folks on our side who will uh, point out that the uh, tax cuts that you're talking about do, in fact, apply only to certain people in this country, that other people in this country will, in fact, be paying, in effect, higher taxes than they now do. Well, you know, I've I, I, I got to tell you, I've read that stuff. I mean, we are Well, why don't lose... you explain about the EITC? Okay, let me tell you about EITC. I mean, this thing in that Mr. House... Reagan and everybody else thought was the greatest program in the world. And you know, are you aware of the fact that I've registered my concern about EITC? That I'm, I'm, in, I'm in internal debates about EITC, I said but I will tell you about it in the House side, is that EITC, and we're going through all the distribution charts, EITC in the House side, for 19, not from 1995 to 1996, everybody is going to go up in EITC. Now, I've got some concerns with some of the discussions in the other body on EITC, and I've registered them both privately and publicly. But let me just say to you, to the gentleman, that um, we need to preserve EITC. And it will be going up 40% increase in EITC under the House of, uh, under the Ways and Means House Plan. 
Uh, but a good deal less than it otherwise would. And well, these are people, uh, no, no. these are people just about at the poverty level whom we've always wanted to encourage to work. I mean, this is a program which Republicans have supported even more strongly, perhaps, than Democrats in the past. All I'm trying to say is that you're not talking, when you speak about tax cuts, you're talking about only por a portion of the population. And somewhere around half the people of this country, middle-income people and lower-than-middle-income people, are going to be a little bit worse off, some, some of them a good deal more, let me, let me, than a little bit worse off under this bill. Look, the credit is going to be $538 for a person that earned $28,000. These are increases over 95. What, I, what I'm saying, I want, I, look, let's talk about EITC because I think the gentleman knows that I want him to know that when you look at an earned income tax credit program, I don't want to squeeze a, a single woman with two children, and that's why I keep looking at all the charts to make sure that what we've done in the House has been reasonable. You know who wrote it? You know who wrote the EITC section in the House? Nancy Johnson. Not a right-wing Republican. And what, what changes have we made in EITC? We say, if, you know, in 93, they had uh, childless couples put, on the, uh, put in the program. That was not the purpose of the program. The purpose of the program was to help the working poor with families get off welfare. We've maintained that. Secondly, we say that, uh, and, and the GAO will tell you that there's fraud and waste in the program. Look, the gentleman knows the program has exploded. It's still going to grow significantly under us, 40%. How much more do we need to have it grow? Now, I've got problems with the Senate EITC. I may find out that, that, they're, that they are right in what they're doing. When you combine EITC with a $500 tax credit, families aren't losing, particularly in the House. Well, people, people who, who are... Get the EITC, get the, get the tax credit, too? What I'm saying is, they don't you know, do EITC that. works as a phase-out program. Sure, if they have taxable income, if they have a tax liability, EITC maxes out at about 13, is, I think it's 13,000, where it maxes out, and then the credit starts to be reduced. And at some point, the credit for people making twenty-seven, twenty-eight thousand dollars they st they still have an income tax liability. What the, fa what the $500 tax credit would do is to, is to wipe that out, and frankly, they're now talking about a proposal over here to make it apply to all liability. But, I mean, I would say to the gentleman that you've read the articles about EITC, uh, you've read the debate going on, and the debate is um, the facts don't speak for the rhetoric being generated about EITC. All I was asking about was, couldn't we get to a balanced budget sooner if we didn't have to provide $245 billion or thereabouts for a tax cut? I think the answer is yes. I wish it were being done that way, as I know many of your folks wish it were. And I wish you well, and I hope we end up with something a little bit more moderate and reasonable that the President can sign that's, uh, that's better than what you've got here today. Fair point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You just wanted to hook me and land me in the boat, and I should have just gone along. <laughs> As I uh, recognize Mr. Goss, let me, I, I just have to make a couple of uh, observations, um, particularly about AmeriCorps. Uh, John, you serve on the Armed Services Committee along with your other duties, and I don't know how, how you managed to get all that done. But, uh, you know, it, it becomes a question of priorities again. AmeriCorps has cut into our military volunteer, all military, uh, all volunteer military, uh, so much that um, when you talk to any one of your recruiters back home, I don't care whether it's the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, uh, you're going to find out that they have less people coming in, even inquiring now about the all volunteer military and about the. Uh, peacetime GI Bill. But there are useful things for young people just, to do other than just be in the military, well, aren't there, Mr. Tell Chairman? You something. We, uh, we need to encourage it, my friend, when you depend on an all-voluntary military. We need to encourage people and to be just, teachers. Would you and other not, not interrupt, please? I will not interrupt you anymore, Well, sir. I would hope you wouldn't. I shan't. Because Can I would I, uh, show you the same courtesy. Let me finish for yes. a minute. You know, President Clinton is talking about putting 25,000 of these young men and women into combat over my dead body. Uh, but let me tell you something, this AmeriCorps program has interfered with our enlistment programs in the military. So the reason I wanted to bring that up, Tony, was that um, it becomes a question of priority. You mentioned, uh, you know, that maybe the uh, federal government can do a better job. I disagree with that 100 uh, percent. But regardless of whether you're right or I'm right, it becomes a question of whose responsibility is it. 
the question is that uh, outside of the, the uh, providing for a common defense for these republic of states, that most of these responsibilities belong at the state and county and town and city and village governments. Uh, and that's really what this is all about. It's a question of duplicity. And when you look at what we have done with this budget, uh, I just really get exercised when I hear that we're cutting, and I heard uh, you and Mr. Mokley say we're cutting this and we're cutting that. We are cutting none of these programs. What we are doing is merging and consolidating and privatizing and defunding and outright abolishing dozens of these Washington bureaucrats inside the Beltway. That's really what this argument's all about, and they are squealing like stuck pigs. Now, having said all that, let me yield can to I, Mr. Chairman, can uh, I just make one I'll point? I want to make available to the, the gentleman from California following the, uh, the hearing. The change in after-tax income for the Republican tax plan involving EITC. And uh, for those that, are, that, that watch this, it's the Earned Income Tax Credit. And in, um, from 95 to 96, uh, starting at $7,000 where people have tax liability, they all go up. I mean, in, I'm spending a lot of time analyzing the Earned Income Tax Credit because it is a program designed to get people off the rolls and give them incentives to work. And in their our house plan, they do, they do well. And I, I just I want the gentleman to know that I think if we were to kill this program, it would be a mistake. Uh, I mean, I want you to know that as one human being to another, not, I, I'm very concerned about this program, and I think we're doing fine here in the House. And we're going to look at what the Senate's doing. I've talked to a lot of people and want to make sure that we maintain the heart and the soul and not squeeze the people who are, uh, who are the ones trying to get themselves in a permanent job. I appreciate the gentleman asking the question. And lastly, John, as I recognize Porter Goss, you know, as the government gets out of the business of doing a variety of things, all of these things that we've been talking about, it becomes absolutely essential that the private sector be able to pick up that slack. And if you don't put money back into their pockets through tax cuts, how are they going to do that? I yield to my good friend, Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, I'm a little mindful that this is a rules committee hearing. And I'm mindful that we have a piece of legislation on the floor that has about every issue in town in it and every issue outside of town as well. I've also taken a look at the witness list, and I've calculated that the national debt will be over $7 trillion at the pace we're going by the time we finished with the witness list. So I am going to try and uh, steer away from some of the issues uh, and get to a couple uh, of very specifics that uh, I need to have your help with, John, oh, if I may. Okay. Although I, I must say I agree, of course, with my chairman that says the solution to all problems are not in Washington. All wisdom is not in Washington, despite the great wisdom that you have. Uh, <laughs> and the one thing that I have that is unanimous at every town meeting I've ever had is a public official, elected official, whether it's local government, state, or, or a federal level, if you ask the question of the assemblage, do you think your government is spending every tax dollar wisely? No hands go up. There is not a person in America who feels that we are doing the best possible job we can with tax dollars, and I doubt there ever, ever will be. The fact of the matter is that I think you've tried to, to pinpoint some of the areas and to suggest we're going to have an increase in federal spending of the magnitude that you've suggested over uh, two, two billion, uh, close to three, three trillion in the next seven years. I don't know how much that is for man, woman, and child, but if you had told me that at the beginning of this, I probably would have been less enthusiastic about the program and say, isn't there a way we can tighten it down some more? Um, the specific I wanted to Thanks, get at. Thanks. No, I agree with you. Well, if, you, you know, if, if we're going to stick to our principle uh, of less government, less spending, more freedom, more choice, uh, it seems to me that uh, you ought to do the job the whole way. And, can I, can I tell you, what's amazed me about the program, and I've been saying for a long time, it's a good first step. It's described inside the city as this revolutionary program. And if you took a $3 trillion increase outside the city, they wouldn't describe it anywhere near, they, I'm not sure you could get them to call it evolutionary. Well, I would suggest that $3 trillion bucks is the total expenditure by budget of the government for one whole congressional term. That's correct. That is correct. Yeah. And that's a lot of money. Um, the, uh, the, the question I wanted to go to, uh, again, 
pardon me for honing in on specifics, but there are some that I think are important, and we have quite a pile of amendments and uh, testimony coming our way. One I wanted to, to ask you particularly about is the earnings test limitation. That is an area of great interest in terms of benefiting people at the lower end of the income uh, spectrum who are in difficult straits uh, as senior citizens, sometimes beyond their major earning capacity, who nevertheless have needs or desires to be able to earn some money without a, a tax penalty. Uh, we had uh, promised that we would deal with that. It's been in and out of this legislation. Where are we on it now? Well, it's out because we have a technical problem. Uh, I'm not a parliamentarian, but the, the, the problem in a nutshell is anything that affects the Social Security Trust Fund is subject to a point of order. And the Senate could made a point of order against this entire bill. So the idea that a senior citizen can work more and not be penalized for doing it, which was part of our contract, will be put on a separate track. And I would expect that uh, that legislation will be brought up, well, will be brought up before the end of this year. In terms of uh, precisely what date, I don't know, but it is a technical problem, not a lack of uh, enthusiasm we have for the idea. So it's fair to say that uh, there will be tax relief, but it will not necessarily come in this. It won't. That particular provision will not be in this bill for technical reasons. Okay. Well, perhaps that cures Tony that we're taking some of the tax cuts out of the bill, but I, I think it's a mistake. I mean, those are the kinds of things that I don't want to give up, and I have a lot of senior citizens who, who need to be able to earn money without paying penalty yeah. tax. Well, if it wasn't for the technical problems we have. Okay. We there are some other areas, and in the interest of time, and, and deferring to my uh, colleagues on the Rules Committee, I don't want to take a, a lot of time, but we are going to be hearing um, questions about why are we not using the Senate Medicaid formula, for instance? Doesn't that help some people more than others? Doesn't that bring relief more quickly? Uh, that's an area of concern for some people, uh, and, and it's a very important point uh, to some of us. We will be hearing uh, other questions about agricultural programs. We will be hearing amendments uh, on uh, environmental issues as well. There will be a broad spectrum, uh, and I would like to be able to come back to you uh, and ask for your assistance privately, if I could, uh, if we have residual matters left over uh, rather than trying to debate each and every one of those issues now. Let me just say one thing about, uh, about the Medicaid formula. You know, in the past, we gave the Medicaid uh, money uh, based on per capita income. And we have ch now changed the Medicaid formula to target the money to those places where they have the greatest needs. And uh, we're using three new factors. Three-year rolling average on a number of residents in poverty in the state. The severity of the state's Medicaid caseload. In other words, how many elderly women and children, poor women and children, and a health care cost index. Now, some folks look at what they got last year, then they look at what they get this year, and they say, I'm a loser. Well, Medicaid ought to be run on the basis of who needs it not on the basis of who can get it. Now, I know Florida's got some unique problems, and there are some states that get bumped the, uh, along the wrong way under any formula. And obviously, as we go to conference, the difference between a House and a Senate formula is going to have to be reconciled. And we want to do it in a, in a fair manner. But I think at the end of the day, we, just, we really want to make sure that those who need it get it. And we've got to be open-minded about the way we put the formula together. And there are some states that have particularly unique problems, and we'll have to deal with it. I think that the, the, the formula that the House has is indeed a tremendous improvement in terms of getting the service delivery where the needs actually are. There's no question about that. Whether it is the best job we can possibly do or not, I agree, is a question that remains open. One thing I would like to congratulate you for is recognizing uh, and providing for the immigration, the illegal immigration uh, load that comes in under this uh, area, because I do think some, some positive progress has been made in that area. Uh, and I don't know whether it's a better formula in the Senate or the House on that. We'll see as we go along. But I think it was great that it is recognized because it's a real fact of life. Uh, that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Let me uh, just add on. Porter and I were talking earlier about this 24 percent increase that we'll have over the next seven years and that some of us would like to see it tighten down a little more. And for that reason, this clearly should be a bipartisan compromise because we have, I believe, really addressed many of the concerns that a number of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have raised. Let
Let me just expand on one thing that, that uh, the Porter brought up, and that is on the Social Security issue. Now, because of this point of order that can be raised in the Senate, obviously that does raise a problem there. But there was also another provision that was part of our contract with America, the outside earnings on Social Security uh, limitation. Now, that is still maintained in this bill, is it not? The the one that comes out is the earnings test. That's the one that comes out is the earnings test. Okay. But, but we still but, do. No, the tax on, on the Social Security, that's that's still in the bill. Right. That relief Great. is still in the okay. bill. Okay, thanks. Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to uh, focus your attention, if I may, on the agricultural portions of this bill. Um, if I understand what happened, uh, the Agriculture Committee deadlocked was not able to report out uh, any agricultural provisions. Uh, you had four members, four Republican members on the Agriculture Committee who, who did not vote for the, uh, the position of the other members of the Agriculture Committee, so you weren't able to do anything. And suddenly then we have a big section in this bill on agriculture. Now, where did all this come from? Was this, uh, did this come from the Speaker's office? Was this written uh, by the members of the Budget Committee? Where did these farm provisions come from? Well, it was essentially written as the gentleman knows, by the chairman of the committee, Mr. Roberts. Um, the situation is, is that, um, I mean, the real question is, do we want to continue to operate the farm programs in the country like we have since Roosevelt put this program into play? Uh, do we want to continue to pay people for not, uh, for not growing things? And what Roberts did, Chairman Roberts did, was to say that we need to delink production from payments. And uh, it's a very controversial deal. It's historic. And uh, he couldn't get it out of his committee. Now, if the committee can't report to me, then I have the authority to come here and, and, and help the committees meet their marks. And Roberts, uh, Chairman Roberts, has worked to, um, to help. He didn't help me make the mark. I'm, ho I'm his horse holder on this provision. And... Um, I happen to believe in the Freedom to Farm Act. I think it makes good sense. But I will tell the gentleman that I would rather be named the executor of an estate than to have to be involved in discussions in negotiating agriculture policy. It's very tough. Well, I, I would, and this, uh, this bill is still subject to change uh, in this rule. I would tell uh, the chairman, I have uh, significant rural areas in my district now. And I've spent a great deal of time uh, in my district in the last several months. And I have people come up to me on the street and say, Congressman, if this Freedom to Farm Act becomes law, we're not going to have anybody farming anymore. We're not going to, uh, they're going to get out of farming. They're not going to be able to get any new people to come into farming. People in the agricultural community, in the farming areas in my state, and I have a feeling that that's true in other states too because of the opposition from members of your own party uh, who serve on the Agriculture Committee, uh, feel like this is a disastrous proposal. And uh, we have been, uh, one of the things that's made us great as a country is that we've had a, an abundant supply of food at reasonable prices for the people of this country. And I'm afraid that you're leading us down a path that's going to be disastrous uh, for the long term. Well, I, I would argue that delinking production from price is frankly going to help out agriculture production in this country. Because what's happened is, uh, because farmers are told, don't plant that field and we'll pay you not to do it, we've had other countries run into the gap created by our lack of agriculture production and capture market share. And uh, I think just the opposite will occur. You know, I've got agriculture in my district and uh, and I will tell you that uh, there's been a constant debate over the years as to whether the government ought to dictate the farm program. Now as you know Roberts doesn't just have a uh, an effort here to delink payments from production he also has a whole lot of regulatory relief that farmers are in favor of but uh, I would argue just the opposite and frankly the American people are tired of a system that, that is a government-run program in agriculture uh, that hurts our ability to capture market share in the world. And yeah, there were some members on our side that didn't go for the program, and they had some legitimate local concerns. Uh, 
but frankly, the national interest is to pass a program that moves agriculture into the 21st century. Well, I will tell you that uh, I have a mixed district. Uh, as I said, I have uh, some farming areas. I also have some suburban areas, and I have some inner city areas. And my urban constituents uh, like to be able to go into the grocery store and find what they, w what they need to purchase at reasonable prices. And I think that you are upsetting the balance that has existed in this country for the last 50 years, and you are threatening the ability of this country to be able to produce at the rates that it's been producing in the past. And I, I would like to ask you, I don't want to take an, an abund uh, all the time you have, because you've, uh, there are other people who want to ask you questions about other things. Uh, I see that Chairman Solomon is not here, but uh, he and I share some concerns about the dairy program. And uh, would you please talk about the dairy program a little bit, about uh, how yeah, that's treated in this legislation and uh, what the major points of controversy are? Well, I'd say that Chairman Solomon's probably for the utter program as well. Um, let, let me say to the gentleman that, you know, we have a freedom to milk program. And um, it, it could be uh, one of the most complicated programs ever created by the federal government. Uh, but what people need to understand is, we actually make payments. We actually make payments to people in the milk program based on their distance from the state of Wisconsin. And what we're trying to do is to create a freedom to milk program. And we're also we're, we're essentially trying to do is to delink payments again uh, from production. And um, there's a lot of concern. There's milk marketing orders out there where, you know, you have all these protocols established that, uh, that, rem that remove the milk program, the dairy program, from the market. I mean, really, the question gets down to this. Are we have any market? farmers left in this country? Well, but that's, you know, the problem is, is that you, you mentioned your urban constituents. As chairman of the budget committee, we have a constant fight between those who represent the cities who argue that the agriculture program that relies on government subsidies and is not efficient, that program ought to be, um, ought to be significantly changed. Sometimes change is a code word for reduced. What, what Pat Roberts has recognized is that in order for agriculture to move into the 21st century, we need to get away from the traditional program. I mean, it makes no sense in the year 1995, moving into the 20th, 21st century, to have Franklin Roosevelt being the one that set agriculture policy. And that's where these programs started. I mean, to say that I'm located 200 miles from Wisconsin, therefore I get a different price than somebody that's located 600 miles from Wisconsin is, is just patently absurd. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen with milk. My fear is that we'll lapse back to the Roosevelt program and we won't move far enough forward possible. I hope not. Let me ask uh, one other question, and then uh, I don't want to take an, uh, uh, an abundant amount of time at this point, uh, because again, other people want to ask you questions. This is a process question. Uh, I've been in this Congress for a while now. Uh, some of the other people on this committee have been here for a while. Mr. Quillen has been here longer than I have. Uh, Mr. Solomon came here the same year that I did. Up until this year, the major agricultural programs, commodity programs, have been renewed every five years. And everyone knew that they were going to come up for renewal every five years. This, this year, uh, the, your leadership has chosen not to bring agricultural policy to the floor for a separate vote under the procedure that's been followed in past Congresses year in, year out so that you could have amendments on the floor, so people could address these concerns, these very controversial issues that you've raised, rather to tuck agricultural policy into this bill where there will be no opportunity to have any votes on the floor on any of these controversial issues. Why wasn't, well, I, why wasn't the farm program, why wasn't the agricultural le legislation, authorization legislation, why wasn't that brought up under the normal procedure, under the regular procedure that's been po followed by Congress for years and years, every time these programs uh, expire, every five years, well, we, so that there could yeah. be a full debate on the floor sure. on these very controversial issues? Well, first of all, I think the gentleman knows. Well, let me tell you what the thinking was of Chairman Roberts. Chairman Roberts felt as though enacting the Freedom to Farm Act was the best way to deal with the, uh, the budget numbers as part of this overall plan. 
and he believes that it's critical that we delink. I hope he's going to appear before the Rules Committee to talk about the Freedom to Farm Act because Pat Roberts is going to be recognized as being a historic figure to move us away from the Roosevelt policies. Now, we are going to have a farm bill later this year. And those people who think that the absurd, uh, absurd subsidies that are connected to sugar and peanuts uh, ought, to be, ought to be gotten rid of as well. And they're going to have a chance in the farm bill. And if, in fact, we don't pass freedom to milk through this house, possible we won't. We're going to have a vote on it in the farm bill. So we will have an opportunity. Very, very, now, Mr. Chairman, this is October the 25th. And we haven't passed most of the appropriation bills. We haven't sent most of the appropriation bills to the president yet. And recon this reconciliation bill has just come into the floor. And it's going to have to go to conference. And it's going to uh, be voted on and come back out of conference. And we've got banking legislation pending. You're telling me that we're going to have a separate vote on, uh, on farm legislation this year, that, that's good, that your leadership is going to schedule that for a separate consideration yeah, after we are we've going to have reconciliation. A when is that going to be? Um, I, I, what is when, it? When, when is that, when is that I going to occur? I, 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 I can't tell you precisely when, but I can tell you we're going to have a separate farm bill. It's going to happen. Oh, no, it, it, it is. I'm surprised you didn't know this. Yeah, it's going to happen. Uh -huh. That's where all these people who are going crazy about sugar and peanuts I've told them if you can't get it in this bill, frankly, let's, let's hit the nail on the head. The agriculture program in this country doesn't work very well. And what we're trying to do is to make it a market-oriented program that will recapture world markets and bring sanity and rationality to the way in which we do agriculture production. Secondly, you couldn't load it up with everything. That's why they couldn't get it through the committee. Uh, we want to change sugar. I mean, we got a handful of rich families in the country controlling sugar. Uh, we want to do away with it. It'll benefit consumers. It's an absurd program. We couldn't put it in this bill. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to have it in the farm bill. But you know what bothers me? I'm afraid vested interests will kill sugar reform in the farm bill. Uh, I see this opportunity to move this agriculture reform through reconciliation. Well, let me just say it's one of the very few issues where the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have both said that we ought to build a statue to Pat Roberts. Chairman, now, some is, people would put it one place, and other people would put it another. But, but now, they've hailed him as, as, as being historic. Mr. Chairman, I think I detect a basic distrust of democracy in your remarks, in that uh, on the one hand, you say that we're going to have a separate farm bill. On the other hand, you're saying, gee, if we have a separate farm bill, the special interests are going to prevail. And so that's why we need to put all well, this agricultural I, legislation yeah. into the reconciliation yeah. bill, where there can't be yeah. separate well, votes on well, it. Let me just come down squarely on the side of where the bulk of the American people are suspicious about the power of special interests in this city. I'm right with them on that issue. And so you want to send something under a closed rule where there's no opportunity to vote up or down on any of these commodity programs and tell us, oh, trust us, there'll be another vote. Just wait around till Christmas Eve well, or some yeah. other time. There'll be another vote on these yeah. issues somewhere down the line. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the agricultural policy is uh, very important to a lot of people in this country. A lot of people yeah. in your region, in the Midwest. A lot of people in the area that I represent, in the South. And I just... I find it very difficult to understand why your leadership has chosen to conduct agricultural policy in the way it has, because you're afraid to bring it to the floor where people can actually vote, where democracy can be, where democracy can express itself. I just, uh, I find that very difficult to understand, and I, and I just want to close by saying that there is a, there is a pattern here. Um, first, it was. Uh, uh, Medicare was bad because uh, it, was, uh, it hadn't been changed since it was set up 30 years ago. Uh, and now agricultural policy is bad because it hasn't been changed since Franklin Roosevelt set it up. Uh, you know, ac Medicare is one of the most popular programs we've ever had in this country. Uh, set up by a Democrat, passed by a Democratic Congress, proposed by a, two Demo a series of Democratic presidents. And now we have you attacking farm policy because Franklin Roosevelt was the one that instituted no, it. No, uh, no. I, I just I, I find let me, it difficult let me just, to comprehend. Let me just say to the that. gentleman that, frankly, Americans don't understand the system where you get paid on the basis of how far you're located away from the state of Wisconsin. Well, then and why they don't, don't we vote under, on and they those don't, issues? And they don't understand the system 
that pays farmers not to grow something. See, they don't get that. They think that doesn't make sense, and they think there's a better way to fix it. And that's what we're doing with the agriculture program. We're improving it. Every, you know what? I, I would maintain that most programs over, most things in life over time, when allowed to just collect on a shelf, need improved and innovated. And we shouldn't be afraid of change. I mean, I think change is a good thing. Change is wonderful. Why don't we do it according to democracy? Why don't we permit members of Congress from my state, Democrats and me, Republicans from Texas, to be able to right. vote on these issues on the floor, rather than tucking this into this bill under a closed rule? As the gentleman knows, you wrote the rules on how the Budget Act works. And those rules say that if a committee is unable to report to the Budget Committee the numbers to meet the reconciliation numbers that I've given them, I then have the authority to come to the committee. I'm following your rules. Now, are you saying that your rules are not democratic? Well, why has why your, your leadership refused to bring a farm bill to the floor? Well, that's what well, I that's don't understand. Which, take one or the other. The point is, this is not anti-democratic. This is what you wrote. I can think that we could stand a lot of change in the 74 Budget Act, and we're going to have it. But the bottom line is, I'm doing nothing more than the rules that you established for me to follow. All right. I, I think okay. we've exhausted this okay. subject. Thank you very well, much. Uh, Martin, I'm going to get into this a little bit because uh, <laughs> <laughs> you are, uh, and I Now we're going to see well, about, you know. Well, we, uh, we share an interest, but I'm going to tell you something, that uh, the Budget Committee has done exactly as they are instructed to do by this Rules Committee. Um, and as far as the farm policy is concerned, there will be a, a farm bill. Uh, it's unfortunate that it couldn't have come first before the, uh, before the reconciliation bill. But under the rules of this House, that was impossible because it was impossible to reach an agreement. And I want to, even though I have some concerns, uh, as the gentleman knows, with, the, uh, with a, uh, something called milk marketing orders, which has nothing to do with the budget whatsoever, uh, uh, I still think that uh, we are moving in the right direction. And it's, a, in other words, the very fact that Sam Donaldson could be the, the uh, third largest mohair recipient uh, in the nation uh, uh, shows there's something wrong with the system. So, John, we are moving in the right direction. The truth of the matter is the United States government no longer has the money to subsidize all of these programs, and we are getting out of the well, subsidy. Mr. Chairman, Let me I finish. I, I, it's my time now. Sure. Uh, just for example, uh, when you start talking about butter, when you start talking about powdered milk, when you start talking about cheese, I don't think those processors ought to be subsidized by the taxpayers. When you start talking about milk marketing orders, that's a different subject. <laughs> and that's, uh, uh, all, that does, all that does is just guarantee we're going to have a stable price and the small dairy farmers in America are going to stay in business. Right. Yeah. Well, the Chairman, Back to sacred cows. <laughs> well, the, I'd be uh, glad to yield to my good friend, Mr. Uh, perhaps uh, this was discussed while you were out of the room. Perhaps you can enlighten us as to, do, do you know when the farm legislation uh, is going to come to the floor, when we're going to have the opportunity to vote on all these issues? No, but I've had uh, many discussions with the Republican leadership and with, uh, with Pat Roberts, uh, uh, and he wants to bring it as soon as he possibly can. But uh, it's a very complicated issue. It's, uh, it's restructuring the entire farm policy, and it should, uh, should, be, uh, it should be done in the committee, you know, through the committee system, and I believe it's going to be, and I don't think it'll be that much longer. Well, I was only pointing out while you were out of the room that it's October 25th and right. uh, the clock is running and the programs expire. Now, uh, before I left, I think John Linder was waiting to be recognized. Uh, John Linder of Georgia. Uh, let me just comment that to suggest that there will have no farmers left if we change the farm program is an insult to most farmers who farm not because of government but in spite of government. Um, and in fact, if we take some provisions out of this bill, we're still operating under last year's commodity rules because they're extended for two years. Is that correct? If you just drop sugar, for example, out of the, out of the program, uh, there's no financial impact to that, is there, in terms of the budget? I, I'm, I'm told there's about a $500 million impact uh, on that. Would Over seven years? The, the current... You're saying there's a $500 million savings under the uh, let me let me, take, let me take that back. What, what the bill does is it terminates the marking orders and allotments, and it sets, a, uh, uh, it's, it sets the, the new loan rate for cane sugar and refined sugar beets at 95 levels. So uh, there are some savings, but uh, very small. Um, 
In they, they just said 500 million is peanuts. I, I think they meant that literally. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the few Georgians who is also critical of the peanut program. You're also what? I'm one of the few Georgians who is also critical of the peanut program. Um, and I'd like to comment on what, uh, just in general, what uh, my friend from California, Mr. Bielenson, said that if we eliminated the $245 billion in tax cuts, we'd reach balance quicker. And I think it's arguable that we would reach balance later. In 1921, 1961, 1981, taxes were cut precisely to spur the economy and create jobs, and those created new taxpayers and new revenues. Ronald Reagan gets a lot of blame for the deficits, but his tax cuts actually doubled federal revenues between 1980 and 1990, from about 519 billion to 1 trillion. Uh, that hardly adds to deficits, spending does. And what we're trying to get a hold of here is spending. I had a call last Friday from a constituent who said, I'm sick and tired of you talking about reducing the rate of growth. I want to see some real cuts. And I think there's a general consensus in, in the country for, for genuine cuts. I also think that the growth of 19 million new jobs during the 1980s is partly attributable to Jimmy Carter's cut in capital gains, which took venture capital pools from $50 million in 1977 to $5 billion in 1986, and generally spurred, provided the capital for creating new jobs. Um, I think we can do that again. I honestly believe that, I know for a fact that every single succeeding year from 1977, we had increases in revenues from the capital gains category. And when we raised capital gains in the budget office, it, or CBO, scored that as an increase in revenues, that actually revenues fell off the table from capital gains. So if we were to take the tax provisions out, in my judgment, we may not come to balance. Yep. And uh, I commend you for what you're doing. I do think we've got a few problems with farm issues yet, though, and, uh, and it's going to be a bit sticky fixing them. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Ms. Linder. I, uh, I, I think that, you know, you guys, as I said before, you not only control overhead, but you also have to increase sales or increase revenues. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with capital gains uh, as it plays out over the next few years and, and the revenue that, that does come in. Mr. Dreyer, leader in this effort, will argue that it will be a, will have bountiful increases. Greenspan would, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, would argue that it, it at least would have paid for itself had we indexed uh, uh, in the 80s, it would have paid for itself. We count it as a, you know, multi countless billions of dollars loss in revenue. It'll be interesting to see how the numbers work out. I believe they will work out as a gain, or at least paying for itself. <clears throat> Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kasich, actually, <clears throat> this is the Rules Committee, and I was wondering what the rule is going to actually look like. Have you, did you state that when you first started? No. Can you tell us what you think the rule should be? Well, I think we're going to do about six hours worth of uh, debate uh, with an opportunity for the, the uh, majority, the minority leader to uh, offer an alternative. And um, that's, uh, I think, what makes the most sense. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be glad to yield. <coughs> Last night, uh, I asked <coughs> unanimous consent and received it uh, to uh, begin debate even before we decide what kind of a rule we're going to uh, produce, uh, which would allow three hours of general debate this evening, uh, equally divided among both sides. And uh, if, uh, if they use all three hours, fine. If they don't, then the rule tomorrow would probably, and although we haven't decided yet, uh, nor, and we are still in uh, consultation with the minority leadership as well as uh, you, Tony, uh, we more than likely, because we were able to move up the starting time today on the floor from 12 to 11 a.m., and tomorrow morning from 10 a.m. to 9 a.m., uh, we're going to extend the debate time and give a total of six hours, three tonight and three tomorrow. Um, plus, uh, I believe that uh, with the consent of the committee here, that the uh, Mr. Gephardt, the majority minority leader, uh, will be uh, given the right to offer uh, whatever substitute he cares to offer, and uh, uh, there would be an additional hour on that uh, that debate as well. And of course, you would be entitled to your uh, traditional motion to recommit at the end of the uh, debate. That's so. Essentially, we're going to get at most two votes on this, possibly three. But 
one real vote. So I have one vote on this whole issue here. And we have one, everybody in the Congress has one vote on thousands and thousands of changes to this government. And, uh, Tony, I would just have to respond to that. Uh, that's the same as we've had every year that, uh, that I can recall since I've been on the Rules Committee, which is seven Gary, or eight years. I, I don't ever remember a bill like this that had so many items in one bill reconciliation? that made so many changes. Never have we ever had a reconciliation bill like this that one vote changes so many things in Medicare, Medicaid, farm policy, foreign policy, agriculture policy, I mean, uh, commerce policy, trade policy, one vote will decide uh, well, complete well, change Neal, in the government. Well, General Neal. I'd like to finish, John, if I could. Everybody's had their chance. I'd like to have my chance. Um, <clears throat> John, this is, a, this is a statement that I think it was put out by the White House. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it was. And it talks about the impact of the Republican budget cuts on children in Ohio. And, um, and I've heard a lot today. I've heard a lot of people say, even Chairman Solomon said, that this really, what this, what this is all about is bureaucracy. This is about cutting bureaucracy. But you know, a lot of that, some of that is true. Uh, there are some cuts that need to be made. There's no question about it. I think everybody in the Congress believes we need to move towards a balanced budget, have a balanced budget. The question is time. How long does it take? The question is spending priorities. You've decided, the Republicans have decided to shift most of the responsibility to the states, provide for a tax cut, and uh, at, at the same time, a lot of the poor people, a lot of the senior citizens are going to get hurt very, very bad. And I'm just wondering if you know that, for example, in Ohio, just in the health care area, that this eliminates Medicaid coverage for as many as 158,189 kids. Uh, that, that's, that's one thing. It eliminates the Medicaid coverage. These kids aren't just 19 years of age. They're a lot less. A lot of them are very disabled. It, uh, it cuts infant mortality projects by 52% in Cleveland, Ohio. Just it will say that again. It says it cuts Cleveland infant mortality projects by 52% in 1996. It, um, for example, will cut nutrition assistance for 606 children in Ohio. It, uh, it provides for a cut of 33% of uh, environmental sewage or sewage that's flowing into the waters while children will live, drink, play, etc. Now, if, I mean, did you, I have to believe that you understand that this is going to happen. I mean, I, this is something that's been studied. Urban Institute has put out part of these figures. This is not about, this budget is not about bureaucracy. This is about real, real people. It's about people on Medicare that for the most part in your district, in my district, you know, they're making, uh, they're probably living on eight to $12,000 a year. And their Medicare is probably gonna go up $500 to $1,000 a year. And they're gonna get less services. That's not bureaucracy. It's about Medicaid, where we're talking about 160,000 children in Ohio, in our state, that are going to be eliminated from Medicaid. It's a, 20, it's a, it's a huge cut. Now, what would you say, if that's going to happen, what would you say to these well, kids? Well, I, I, would, I would say that the people who put those studies out are, are dead wrong. I mean, you can cook the books any way you want to cook the books but why down should there. I? They're good at cooking the books down John, there. Let me, let me respond. I, let me respond. Medicaid. Do you know who one of the strongest advocates is for our program to reform Medicaid? George Voinovich. Now, I, wouldn't, I would hope that you wouldn't think that George Voinovich would want to take 100,000 uh, children off the rolls. George Voinovich believes that by giving him the flexibility, repealing the Boren Amendment, which prevents him from being able to negotiate with nursing home operators and hospitals on rates, 
that being able to give him the flexibility to serve his population, he, can not only, he will not only be able to carry through on meeting the population's needs in Medicaid, but he'll be able to have an expanded program to treat people who currently don't have health care coverage. So, I mean, on Medicaid, I mean, the simple fact of the matter is because the administration puts out some, the administration has engaged in more f irresponsible fear tactics uh, th than anything that I have seen since I've been in the Congress of the United States. Well, this is very interesting. Now, the Urban Institute also put out these figures, too. Now, why I'm supposed to believe you, I'm supposed to believe you when we haven't even had any hearings well, on who, Medicaid? Well, who, who would you... Who, yeah, we who had am I hearings. supposed to believe Well, here. let me ask you, who would you believe? The, the people at the Urban Institute, have you ever met them? Do you know them? I know some or, of them. Or 30 governors in the state of, uh, in, across this country who believe in this program. I mean, I'll put my money down on George Voinovich and Tommy Thompson and Bill Weld in Massachusetts and John Engler in Michigan and Tom Ridge, our former colleague from Pennsylvania, Don Sunquist, our former colleague, governor of Tennessee, over, over some uh, person that's, that's, uh, that's been hired to provide a biased study out of the Urban Institute. John, have you read the paper this morning in the Washington Post? There is an article in the paper when they're gonna, we're going to transfer the welfare programs to the states. The article in the Washington Post said today they don't know how they're going to handle it. They're not even prepared. The bill hasn't even well, passed yet. Joan Lawrence, they're, do you know Joan? They are scared to death of this bill. They don't know what they're going to do well, with look, it. Well, look, Joan Lawrence, who's the chairman of the subcommittee of the House Finance Committee in Ohio, is thrilled about what we're going to do. You should call her today. She thinks they, they can better run the welfare programs in Ohio than we can run them here. I mean, it's just a matter of whether you think you know what it, it really gets down to? It really gets down to a matter of whether you think we are capable where we live of being able to solve our problems better than a bunch of bureaucrats who are well-meaning and, and good folks here in this city. Now, John, now, I think the Ohio legislature will be a, do a better job of designing. My, my honest view, you were in the legislature, I was in the legislature, the same legislature. I think that we would do a better job of running, writing our Medicaid program and our welfare program in Ohio uh, better than what they're writing it down here. Don't well, you think so? No, I don't. Well, I, if you cut them, if you cut them thirty percent, and we pass the responsibility on to them, and we say you got the responsibility, you do it. You don't think they're going to have to eliminate? We're not cutting them. You don't 30%. think hundreds of thousands of kids are going to get eliminated? I, I'd say to the gentleman, Medicaid is going up by thirty-nine percent in our bill. I, I, you know, you all say that. But, but that, it is. That means that the population is going to stay steady. We're not going to have any more children. No more senior citizens are going on the roll. Let me tell you what we're going you to do. You know, John, you know as well as I do that Medicaid, your people that make $10,000 a year, senior citizens, they're going to, their premiums are going to double. They're okay, probably going to pay an extra Medicare. $500 to $1,000 a year. You can't, you can't say that. I There's can't no say facts. It. Let me, let me tell you it. What, let me tell you what the Medicare program does. One more time, we debated on the floor. Each, in, each senior citizen, the average citizen, senior citizen is going to go from 4700 bucks to 6800 bucks behind them. You know what the average a person who's not a senior citizen has behind them? $1,900. We have $2,900 more dollars behind the average senior citizen than somebody who's not a senior citizen. Secondly, do you know what the average growth rate is for medical programs in large corporations in this country? below zero. Procter & Gamble had no growth in their health care programs. The average non-Medicare growth rate in the country is 4%. You know what it's going to be in Medicare at the end of the day? 6.7%. We've got $4,800 versus $1,900 for the senior citizen versus a non-senior citizen, and the program is going to grow faster for the senior citizens than the non-senior citizens. You know, I think you, I think you, I think you really believe that. Then, then why do all the people that are calling my office, they must be calling your office, senior citizens, and they, they are scared to death. They know their premium is well, going Well, I'll up. tell you, they have been scared to death. Let me is tell it, you. I the, mean, wait a minute. Can well, I, well, can I me, ask the question? Yeah. Or, I mean, sure. You, you've been talking. Let me talk a little bit. Okay. You don't, so in other words, if I listen to you that everything is beautiful, everything's rosy, nobody's going to pay more, services aren't going to be I cut, I didn't say nobody's going to be eliminated, more. that's what you're saying. No, let me, me. fit, I, I want to finish. You, you would have us believe that, and then you would have us believe the bill of which you brought here, of which the party, your party wrote, of which we haven't had a heck of a lot of hearings, of which nobody knows what's in this bill that affects thousands of programs, that were to believe you, 
And I'm, and I'm not to believe the people that are calling my office saying, you know, all kinds of questions. Many of them are going to be kicked off the, the, you know, that have home health care. They're probably, many of them are probably going to have to be forced into nursing homes, which the standards are going to be lowered. Well, let, let me finish on Medicare. And, but you're, you're okay. but, I mean, let me tell Go you ahead. what's going to happen. The person in your district. Right now, they're paying 31% of the costs of Medicare Part B, unless they're very poor, and then they qualify as Quimby's. But let's take the person in your district. Let's take my, uh, uh, my uncle. If he decides to say, stay in the traditional Medicare program, his premium will remain at 31% of the costs. You know, when the program was started in, in 65, it was 50% of the costs. That, there are no additional costs for that senior citizen if they stay in that program. They're going to pay a 31% of the total cost of Part B. That's exactly where they are today. There's no change in that. Now, if my uncle decides to go into a private plan, my uncle probably won't have a Part B premium. This is the fact. My uncle will not have a Part B premium. He will probably qualify for eyeglass coverage and prescription drug coverage. And if he has to go into the hospital, he won't have a deductible. I mean, maybe we should stop. So that's, Look, I'm, you know what I'm so willing nothing, to say? Nothing's really going to happen to these people. But let, me, let me just say, the, the, I finished, let me say to the gentleman, there is... Jerry, I've had a lot of people before but, me but, that have asked a lot of questions. And can I, we're, we're getting ready to wrap can, up. I just want to finish I just this. Want to, I just want to be able to finish. I, 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 I want to finish this. But when, when Jerry, somebody... the, biggest, the biggest problem, though, that I have is I, got, I have one vote, and it's affecting thousands of programs. This is the, probably the only time I'm going to get to ask a question about this whole, this whole government that we're changing here. We're changing it overnight, and John is saying, and I believe he believes it, but he's saying, well, really, everything is beautiful. What I'm, Money's increasing, what I'm nobody's going to get hurt, and no. everything is going to turn out just perfect. Let, yeah. let, let me just say to the gentleman that I look at the programs. I agreed with Mr. Moakley today on the summer job program. But because the Urban Institute says the sky is pink doesn't mean it's right. I look at the facts. I look at the facts on Medicare. I mean, I'm giving you the facts. Get the rule, get the law, bring it to me and show me how a senior citizen is going to have a $500 increase. That's not in our bill. I mean, give me a fact. Give me a piece of paper, Tony, that, that shows me where this is true. It isn't true. You can't show it to me. So nobody's going to pay any more money. They're going to stay at the 31 percent rate. They're going to pay it just the way they're paying it under the current law, unless they want to get into the private program, and then they're going to get more. Secondly, on Medicaid. I'm just going to tell you that there are 30 Republican governors that said, get rid of the rules, let me run the program the way I want to run it. And George Voinovich has said, our governor of our state, I will do better if you let me run it. Joan Lawrence, not a uh, conservative Republican, has said, let me run welfare. You talk about the nutrition programs. I think we have 23 separate nutrition programs in the federal government right now. Do we believe in nutrition programs? Of course we do. 23 separate programs and 23 separate, bu separate bureaucracies? No way. I'm willing to sit with reasonable people based on hard numbers. They say we have, the White House says we have tax increases in the bill. That's a joke. No tax increases in this bill. That's a joke. Well, John, so when just... they want to talk about facts, I'll listen. I'll talk facts. I'll just say one thing. Tony, would just, you at this point I'll wrap finish. up in your statement? I will, Mr. Please. Chairman. I'll just say one thing. You mentioned one thing about nutrition programs. You're cutting nutrition programs. And you're cutting in some areas. Some are, some are being eliminated and some are being cut 30%. And I'm to believe that a lot of people are not going to be hurt, especially children. The fact what I'm is, suggesting John, they to you be. is you should consolidate the programs and save the money. And what I will say to the gentleman is this. When you, when you bring me the hard facts about these problems, it's like EITC. I've had a lot of concern about the Senate provision in EITC. When you bring me the facts, I'm going to listen. But when the, I don't want to scare people. I, I'm going to just tell you, I don't want to scare people. I don't want to say X is going to happen. You know in the state of Arizona last year in the Medicaid program costs went down. You know why? The facts will come. Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman Kasich, then uh, we'll have to. We'll Chairman Kasich, please don't respond again. Let me, uh, Mr. Hall, are you through?
Okay, thank you very much. We really have to move <laughs> on. And, uh, okay. At this point, uh, we'll hear from the other side of Ohio. Uh, we're surrounded by them here. Mrs. Price of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really an honor to receive my colleague from Columbus, Ohio, here uh, in our Rules Committee. He has done such a marvelous job with this reconciliation package, and as we all know, reconciliation is complicated, it's complex, it's lengthy. Uh, John's wealth of knowledge on every subject that is in it has been demonstrated here today. And I don't want to, he's already been here over two hours with us, and I don't want to spend much more of his time. And there are other members lining up behind him to testify. But John, um, you know, change brings angst. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and it's even more difficult in the atmosphere of misinformation that we've been operating under. And uh, so the congratulations are even more profound because uh, we have had to do this, you have had to do the, the lion's share of it uh, in an atmosphere that really isn't very um, honest and forthright. Uh, so I'll only have one question, Mr. Chairman. John Kasich, why in the world do we call this reconciliation? And do, have you ever thought about renaming it? Because I haven't seen anything very reconciling. Everybody's just fighting. I wanted to tell. John, I wanted to tell Mr. Moakley that reconciliation. Respond in five minutes, will you? Be? Reconciliation sounds like something we do in, in Catholic Church on Saturday. You know? uh, I think we should change the name of this. And let me let me say to the uh, the gentle lady that the only way you can do this this whole deal is to be fair-minded. That's right. Give it, you know, be fair, be, be honest. And, and we have to run around and have people trying to scare people. And I'm not talking about my colleague. He's, he's concerned. But I got to tell you that when they make up numbers and try to scare people, it, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not right and it's not fair. It's not the way that I try to behave in terms of looking at programs. Uh, I will tell the gentle lady this. If we don't get this job done, the whole country is going to be in deep, deep, deep trouble. Absolutely. And we have to get it done. And at some point down the road, we find out we're a little too thin or a little too, th or a little too much on another program. We're going to have to be big enough to come up and, and, and fix it. And I believe we will be, but we've got to do it being fair-minded. Mm -hmm. And I, Mr. Chairman, have said it before in this committee that I don't think that there's any other person in the whole House of Representatives who could have handled this job like John Kasich. He has just uh, done a magnanimous, uh, magnificent uh, performance here. So well, thank I you, most sir. certainly share that view completely. Mr. diaz Balai. So do I, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, uh, Mr. Kasich knows that there are, as with all of us, some aspects and some of the portions of this bill that I have serious problems with. And I'm going to continue to fight to improve them. Uh, for example, I think every member of this committee knows uh, that uh, in the welfare reform provision, there are serious, I have serious problems with some, some of the aspects that I'm going to continue fighting to, to, to improve. But I think it's important to keep our eye on the big picture and what you just said. We've got to solve this problem, the big picture problem for the country. And, you know, I, I try to also find some, some in, in your conversation with Mr. Hall, when numbers are being talked about, uh, some, some specifics to look at. And I just want to end, Mr. Chairman, on two, two areas that I know are of grave concern to all of us. Medicaid, for example. Medicaid spending under our plan will increase $329 billion over the next seven years compared to the previous seven years. And Medicare, fundamental program for the people of this country. Medicare spending will increase $674 billion over the next seven years compared to the previous seven years. I think it's important to keep our eye on specifics when we're talking about what we're doing here in the context of resolving this crucial problem for the future of the country. Thank you, John. Mr. McGinnis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, it is so refreshing to see somebody take the bull by the horns, and that's exactly what you've done, Mr. Chairman, with this bill. Second of all, Mr. Hall, the Democrat out of Ohio, very uh, well-spoken, speaks about what he says are the real people. But the only real people that he's addressing are the real people that are living on the system, people that are taking money out of the system. I would venture to say that your bill, Mr. Kasich, addresses not only some of those needs, but also addresses the needs of the people, real people just as well, who are putting money into the system. 
And there are a lot of people out there that are putting money into the system. The hardworking people that are going to have their backs broken if we don't do something about this deficit. It just seems to me that finally we've seen change in this Congress. Finally, after all of these years, we've got some people with enough gumption, with enough guts, with enough courage to take on the propaganda. And by the way, Mr. Hall, I think that's where most of your calls are being generated, where they're getting their information. To ta have that kind of courage to take on these issues. And you are the leader of that group, and I commend you for it. I think this, obviously I'm not totally happy with this either. But we're going to have a package here that is going to put this country on a new direction, a direction they haven't seen since John Kennedy. I think that's the last time for a short period of time we had a, uh, a positive or surplus. So I commend you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, just uh, conclude by saying that, um, you know, where I come from, it's a sin to not help people who need help. It's equally a sin to help people who ought to be helping themselves. Uh, I, I got to tell you, this has been long and, uh, and at times a uh, uh, little bit of fighting going on in here. Uh, my community, I went to, I'm going to my high school reunion this weekend, Mr. Chairman. When I went the last time, a guy came up to me and he said, you know, I voted you to be the most likely to succeed, which was stunning because I didn't do anything that would let anybody vote that way. And he looked at me and he said, John, I voted for you to be the most likely to succeed. What happened? <laughs> um, I come from a community, when I go to my reunion this weekend, they, they, they won't, many of the people there will not, they're, they're people who the plant closed down on Neville Island uh, tomorrow. Um, you have to have a safety net for Americans. But you know, I was reading a Cato study that indicated that there are a number of states in this country where we are paying, when you add up all the cumulative benefits that people get, that they, these folks on assistance are, have a post, have an after tax, they don't pay taxes on all these benefits, but their income exceeds that of a starting school teacher, a computer operator. I mean, we want to have a system that encourages people to get off public assistance. My dad was on WPA. I'll bet a lot of you have family that at one point was on assistance. This program is not designed to pick on those who are the least among us. We close loopholes on large corporations. We need to do more of it. This plan, in order to succeed over the long haul, has to be balanced. And the bottom line is, is that this plan, by increasing spending by $3 trillion over the next seven years, is reasonable. It represents common sense. And it'll save this country. And every one of those kids that comes from McKees Rocks is going to have a chance to become the chairman of the United States House Budget Committee if we have an opportunity society. And that's what I struggle for. I don't worry about the people born rich. I worry about the people <coughs> born who want to become rich. I want everybody to have a chance. That's what our program is frankly all about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me be here for so long. Today. Well, John, thank you so much for, for being here. And uh, let me just uh, caution you when you go to the class reunion. I recall when you first came here, you looked like a little kid. And now they're going to say, my God, what happened to you, John? <laughs> thank you very, very much. Wait, as long as I don't have to hear about milk marketing <laughs> orders, I'm going to have a good time. Oh, you'll hear a little bit more about that between now and the time we produce this rule. Members debated the bill for three hours Wednesday before seeing the rules package. The Rules Committee worked through the evening until 11 p.m. to determine the structure for today's floor debate. 